start officially, just a, a, a couple of announcements. <coughs> After the <coughs> service there will be tea and cookies out in the, in, at the kitchen in the front. The service is going to be a long service and um, <coughs> it, it's going to be difficult to cut the service down because there are so many things that need to be said. So. Um, please just relax and understand that it is going to be a longer service. When I thought of this service, and uh, it perhaps being a long service, I thought to myself, you know, this is not about me and a long service. This is about a memorial service for Ron. And uh, because of uh, who he was, um, it's going to take us longer. We understand if people have to slip away, but we'd like you to stay and visit afterwards for a cup of tea if you can, if you're, if you're able. And um, <coughs> on behalf of the family, we just want to say thank you very much for coming. We had no idea when we uh, started to plan the size of the marquee. Uh, what we needed and how many seats we were going to need and uh, it looks like we just made it. We saved, we saved the ringside seats for you. <laughs> Let's start our proceedings with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we come together this morning um, at this remembrance service with, with mixed feelings and we thank thee Lord that we can know that thou art with us. We meet in thy name this morning so Lord for that reason we know that thou art with us and we thank thee for that and we ask thee just to presence thyself and may we know that uh, this morning we are in the presence of Almighty God give strength where strength is needed comfort where comfort is needed this morning Lord and we uh, one of our goals for this service this morning is that it might be to thy glory and thy honor so we just ask thee Lord to be with us now give us consciousness of thy presence and we ask this for Jesus sake Amen, Amen. we have gathered together today to honor and remember the life of Ron Sykes our husband our father our pastor and our friend. This memorial service has two faces. On the one hand, we, we rejoice together at the victorious homecoming call to Ron. Uh, when Marilee phoned me on that Thursday, I'd asked her to keep me updated with the latest news. And when Marilee phoned me and, and uh, I picked up the phone, and she said three words, it's all over. Three small words, but with a, a, a lot of meaning behind them. And it was a message that all suffering, all frustration, all struggling was over for Ron forever. <coughs> Home at last. When I put down the phone, I thought to myself, the Lord has come and fetched Ron and taken him home. 
But then I corrected myself. The Lord had not come to take Ron home. All the time that Ron lay in that hospital bed, the Lord was with him. So, in fact, what had happened was the Lord had just said, Come, it's time to go home. And he took Ron. And he took him with him to heaven. And Ron heard the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Amen. Lord. The other face of the services this morning is that we are left behind to carry on. And this morning it's a case of uh, permission to cry granted because Ron's passing has left a great big hole that only the Lord himself can Amen. fill. Amen. Now, this morning our hearts go out to the family to Marilee, Ron's wife, to the children, Renee and Teresa, and Cassidy and Hannah, and Annapurna, Isaac and Heidi, and uh, the, the son, uh, son Isaac, uh, Heidi. There were some people that couldn't come out from the States, and I uh, go out to them as well. Uh, we left Richard behind and we left Scott behind and uh, Jesse wasn't able to come either, another one of the sons and all the grandkids. Our hearts go out to them this morning at this time. Now, uh, we are going to sing some of Ron's favourite hymns a bit later and we are going to have an opportunity a bit later if anybody wants to bring a short tribute to Ron. We're going to give you opportunity to do that. And all that is going to make the service uh, long. Now, just before we start, I want to read Ron Sykes' mission statement. You'll find it in your, your, your bulletin. Um, the name would not be enough to go around, but this is what it says. And we quote from 1 Timothy chapter 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his, uh, and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap up to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned to fables. And all Ron's uh, ministry was to fulfill what uh, Paul told Timothy <coughs> that we've just read. Now, we're going to just go through the program. And uh, uh, we will sing a bit later, but at the moment we're going to have some tributes and some songs from the, the family. And first of all, we're going to ask Renee and Teresa to come. 151. What? Are we able to come? When you come, okay. We're going to stand up together and sing. One of Ron's favourite hymns, the first hymn on the hymn sheet, when he comes. <laughs> Yeah. 
Uh, I've, I've already experienced the grace of God. I experienced it 39 years ago when I bowed my head and asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. I, I didn't know exactly what it was. I couldn't, I couldn't define what grace was. I'd heard that word before. Um, I knew about grace and grace in the, uh, in the Jefferson Airplane in 1960. It was a rock group. That's all I knew about grace. Uh, but when I asked Christ to save me, I, I experienced that grace, that unmerited favor. I, I've never gotten over it. I don't think I ever will get over it. I've experienced the redemption of Jesus Christ that he shed on the cross of Calvary, his precious blood. I, I know who the Lamb of God is that taketh away the sin of the whole world. I've been reconciled. I, God know, I know God, and more importantly, he knows me. I, I've been accepted into the beloved. I'm a child of a king tonight. I'm royalty. I'm a, a peculiar person in an unpeculiar world. There's no such thing as time. Where the streets are paved with gold And you never grow old On the other side I'm glad my sins have been forgiven uh, And that I'm heavenward bound uh, One day I will be in that mansion And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ promised me I'm looking forward to that day Until that time comes And we need to hold the fort And occupy till we come And uh, be good soldiers of Jesus Christ Lots of pretty things where the skies are perfect blue. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't that a great verse? I'd like to look it up in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. For God commendeth his love towards us, in that when we were not sinners, is that what it says? In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wish I could have said goodbye, just one more I love you, oh, am I really getting through? Oh, I've enjoyed being in the ministry. I really have nothing to lie about it. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, sometimes uh, it's down, but most times for me personally, uh, it's, it's been up. I've, uh, I've just had a good time. I, I've, I've enjoyed seeing people saved. Uh, I, I enjoyed seeing the lives turned around and the, the families changed. I've enjoyed seeing young people get born again and uh, get the book in their heart and their soul and get out the street corner with it and stand up in this uh, pleasant, evil world that we live in. Uh, I've enjoyed seeing marriages come together that were falling apart. Uh, I enjoy seeing people who have smiles on their face come to church with smiles on their face. Uh, there's a lot of blessing being in the midst. Jesus Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the way. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know what I am? I'm a missionary. I'm a missionary. We're going to take a different track tonight. I, I have a burden for mission. I've been in church after church after church. And I look out over the congregation, all I see a bunch of young men, a bunch of young women, a, a family. I see healthy people sitting that's got the truth right in their lap. No one can court it. Some of you even preach it. I ask you tonight, is it nothing to you? All of you that pass by? I'll see you on the other side.
never thought that I would be sitting in the first row. <laughs> this is very, very sad for me. My heart. So a lot of you probably don't know who I am. My name is Renee. And I live in America. And I'm the oldest of, of the children. Um, and getting ready to come, I have seven of my own children. And at one point, all of my kids had said they wished that they could be here. He, my dad left a great example to my children. To, their, to his grandchildren of faithfulness. And I'll always be grateful for that. When I was thinking of what to write, a verse came to my mind in Proverbs 22.1. And it said, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. I'm 43 years old, and I can tell you that in all my years, I've not had great riches, but I've had a great name, a good name. I'm married to a preacher back in the state, Scott, and in our, in our church services, a lot of times we'll have a missionary come through, or we'll have a different preacher come through, and we'll start talking, and I'll tell them who my parents are. My parents are missionaries. South Africa, the Sykes, and they'll say, oh, you're a Sykes girl. <laughs> so today, I want to tell you how honored I am that I'm a Sykes girl. I have a good, good name. I want everyone to know he had in my life. So, Dad, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for loving me. Many times growing up, I wasn't the best daughter. But, he never, ever stopped loving me. Also, growing up, he protected me. When I think about growing up and the years that we spent and how he protected me from different things, I think of one story that sticks out in my mind. I was young and uh, did foolish things, and one night, very, very late, uh, I had a boy come calling at the house. Uh, it was not a good boy. In the middle of the night, he came screaming my name, Renee, Renee, and I was scared to death of what my mom and dad would think. And all my dad did was get up out of his bed walked to the front door, pointed his gun <laughs> at him, and he said, you better run, friend, and you better run fast.
there, and it changed me forever. So thank you for that. He also challenged me to read my Bible. When I was young, there was a time when he said, Renee, let's read our Bible, and we're going to have a race. We'll see who finishes it first. Of course he did. <laughs> he was a great Bible reader, and it was a great example for me. And I think he planted a seed in my heart to want to read and love the Bible. And he also, when I was younger, he put a seed in my heart for the ministry. He took me to nursing homes, and um, many times it was just him preaching. And I would do the special, or I would uh, put away the ones that were improv. I remember one time a lady came out and she was not even dressed. So while he was preaching, I had to take care of things on the side. But I appreciated that with him. And my time that I got to street preach with him uh, many times as a teenager, 25 years ago in, in uh, Florida, he'd say, you want to go street preaching? And I'd say, yes. And we'd go on a corner somewhere and we would just preach. And so I had the opportunity six months ago when I visited. He took me to a township and and I got to preach with him again on the street. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> I'm thankful for my dad. For showing me faithfulness to God and, and family in the ministry. And I want that in my life. I want to be counted faithful like he was to me. So, I know that he's gone on before me. But I know he's left behind for me, a godly heritage, and I'm thankful for that. And he left behind a bar of godliness that I hope I can reach someday. So I miss you horribly. And I long to see him again. But for now, all I can do is pray. And the prayer I pray now is even so calm, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Revelations 21.4 And God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. There shall be no more death. There shall be no more sorrow. Not crying. Neither there, neither there shall be no more pain. For former things are passed away. I just have a letter. I'm not a speaker. Um, my name is Teresa Oliver. I had the privilege of marrying my Dad's very first convert, Richard Oliver, <laughs> great man. <laughs> I'm just going to read my dad a letter. My dearest dad, it's been 15 years since I've been in South Africa. It's not the same without you. You, you do not know how much I miss you. I'm here to honor you and to thank you once again for choosing to be my dad. You filled the gap, Dad that so badly needed to be filled. My earliest memory, you're in it. You seem to always have been in my life. <clears throat> As a teenager running the streets in California, getting up to no good, you stepped up to the plate. You got to the Bible-believing church. You became our protector. And you would have done anything to protect us. Even use a gun. <laughs> <laughs> and you proved that several times. You were always kind to me. You always included me as one of your own. And I'm so proud to be called your daughter. Thank you for answering the call and coming to South Africa and leading my husband to the Lord and discipling him to become the man that he is today. I'm sorry where I disappointed you. And thank you so much for graciously forgiving me when I did. You are the strongest man that I know, a great example to us all, and I'm so thankful, and it's an honor to call you my dad. I love you, Dad, and I'll see you in heaven. Your daughter, Teresa. Thank you, Renai and Teresa. Singing. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to call on Cassidy to come this way.
thought about a hundred things to say, but I didn't bring anything with me because I just, I never wrote a speech when I, when me and Dad were talking, driving to create for, for our ride on the on Thursday. I'm just very thankful that I have this year, an entire year, to come home and be with my dad. The last three months have been the hardest three months of my entire life. But last week, Thursday, was the most beautiful day I've ever experienced with my dad. He's the strongest man that I've ever known. I can't think of one negative thing in my entire life about my dad. Not one negative thing. He's never treated one of us badly. He's never, I don't know, my dad was just so calm. He always said he had a bad temper, but he never, he never showed it to us. We've seen him show it to other people. <laughs> but never towards us. I brought my son here to be raised with my dad because I knew that my dad would be an excellent example for my son to be with. And I wanted him, I used to do the numbers, but my dad's got at least 20, 25, 30, my son will at least be able to grow big. I don't know what, what to do now without my dad. My son will never get a limpy. <laughs> That's when my dad would, I think some of the kids in the church know what that is. He'll never sing the Num Num song. He'll never be tickled to death for quarters. But my dad's always going to be here with us. I don't think anyone here will ever forget my dad. He was your pastor. He was my pastor as well. He was your friend. He was my friend as well. But something that I have, that only seven of us in this room have, is that he was my dad.
people tell me that I'm very similar to my mom. I think a lot of us take after my mom. I'm okay with that. I'm actually very, very proud of that. But I also like to believe that I've taken after my dad in some ways. There's some obvious ways I can't be guys. <laughs> actually, the most, many of my features that I have is from my dad. Just my nose and teeth every day. <laughs> for animals, like most of my family, I love for sport, just keeping fit and having a strong body, all of that is for my dad. Like my dad, I'm, I don't have much to say, <laughs> often, I'm a quiet one, my sisters call me the quiet sister, but I'm okay with that because that's who my dad was. My dad, he would go through the whole week without doing anything much. He loved to sit in his office and just search the internet and prepare sermons and go on long bike rides all by himself. So by the time Sunday came and he preached to us, it was actually really neat to hear him, you know? Just like you guys. It wasn't just, oh, there's my dad preaching. It was, you know, that, that's our dad. And that's, he doesn't talk much during the week, so we love that. And I'm always going to miss that. One of the other things that me and my dad have in common is I love for music and for the old hymns. My dad instilled a love for the hymns that we sing in this church in me. I'll never be able to sing another hymn or hear another hymn being sung without thinking of my dad and imagining him standing in front of the church with a look of joy on his face and just sheer enjoyment singing to the top of his lungs. It didn't matter if there was five people in the church. He loved singing. Now, I'm not the greatest singer and I, I can carry a tune, but I'm I don't like singing in public. But one thing God gave me a gift to do is to play piano. And my dad always loved to hear me play piano. It's very, very difficult for me to sit down and play piano, especially those old hymns. I love playing them, and I can sit there for hours and play those hymns. No other music in the world does anything to me like hymns. And that's because of my dad. But I think today, I wasn't going to play, that's like Cassidy, she wasn't going to sing. I wasn't going to play because I didn't think I could handle it, but I think today, I know that my dad would really love it. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter what I played, if I ever played a special or any sort of hymn or anything, he'd always come up to me and go, man, Anna, that was beautiful. <laughs> that was some beautiful playing. It didn't matter if I made mistakes or anything, he'd always say, that was beautiful. There's one hymn that he sang a few years ago with one of our church members. And it's by John Newton, the man who wrote Amazing Grace. And he wrote another song called How Tedious and Tasteless. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very appropriate song because he loved it, for one thing, but also the words of the song. I'm going to read them to you now, and I'm going to sing them, and then I'm going to play the song. But How Tedious and Tasteless the Hours When Jesus No Longer I See. I believe my dad wasn't a, he loved life, he yeah. lived it to the fullest, but I believe the last few years, he, he just had a longing, a strong longing to go to heaven. I know he did, and I, I believe the last few years of my dad's life were tedious for him, because he longed to be with him with his father, with Jesus, the man who he dedicated his whole life to. And I'm finding great comfort, and I know my family is knowing that he is where he wanted to be. As much as sad as it is for all of us, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt where my dad is today. Amen. How tedious and taste is the hours when Jesus no longer I see. Sweet prospects, sweet birds, and sweet flowers have all lost their sweetness to me. The midsummer sun shines, but dim. The fields strive in vain to look gay. 
but when I am happy in him, December is as pleasant as May. His name yields the richest perfume, and sweeter than music his voice. His presence disperses my gloom and makes all within me rejoice. I should, were he always thus nigh, have nothing to wish or to fear. No mortal so happy as I, my summer would last all the year. Content with beholding his face, my all to his pleasure resigned. No changes of season or place would make any change in my mind. While blessed with the sense of his love, a palace a toy would appear, and prisons would palaces prove, if Jesus would dwell, dwell with me there. My Lord, if indeed I am thine, if thou art my son and my song, say, why do I languish and pine, and why are my winters so long? Oh, drive these dark clouds from the sky, thy soul-cheering presence restore, or take me to thee up on high, for winters and clouds are no more. That last line, or take me to thee up on high, where winter and clouds are no more. He's not going to have another winter. You know he hated winter. He's not going to have another sad day. He's up there with Jesus where he wanted to be. I love you, Dad. I don't even know how we're going to carry on life without you. But I'll never, ever, ever forget what you have done for me and this family and for all these people sitting here. Amen, amen, amen.
we had a program and everything, and the first day we went out there to start running, you know, to run down the road, I just start laughing. And said, why are you laughing? From then on, every single training run we did together, we would, I would, we would always start laughing the first couple minutes together. And that went into everything we did together, our biking, or or running, or kayaking, or whatever we did together. Um, as many of you know that my name is Anna Perna, and I'm also living in America. Um, I'm the wild one. <laughs> I'm the family. I'm the one with the most energy and the crazy things, but um, I think I get that from my parents. They're very adventurous and um, very wild and very free, free spirits. You know, nothing ever stopped them doing what they ever wanted to do in life. And, um, you know, my dad has taught us so much growing up, and um, so much about God, and he's built it in our lives, in our hearts, and uh, I'll never forget it. I mean, I was raised in church ever since I was a baby, and I'm just glad that he's gone to where he's been preaching about going all these years. My brother-in-law, uh, Ryan, has said to me the other day in the car that there's no one like you, Dad. There's only one in a million like him. And that's true. There's no one like that. There's no one like my mom. <laughs> there's no one like my mom. My dad would say that. <laughs> he loved my mom's strong will and her spirit. Everything about my mom. So I'm glad that we still have my mom. My name is Heidi. <laughs> I don't know who knows me, who doesn't. I have a strong case of stage fright. <laughs> my sister says to me, just get up and do it. We're dead. Um, I begged my brother to come up here with me. <laughs> um, we have a song that we dedicated for my dad. You know, I am my dad's youngest daughter. I'm the daughter of Ron Sykes, and I'm proud to say that. I sat up for nights trying to write, till the morning trying to write something okay to my dad. <laughs> I realized I don't have anything to say. Because I had three months to say it. And I'm grateful that I had those three months to say everything I wanted to say to my dad. So, this is just a song my mother wrote, and I asked to sing it with him. And it's a privilege. Thank <laughs> you. 
way more nervous than she is. You <laughs> never, ever, ever do. <laughs> ever. <laughs> So hard, seems so unfair, easy to fall into fear and despair. When the walls start to crumble, come tumbling down. Will they keep fighting and we just ain't around? The strength of your love will always abide me. Comfort and keep me, Daddy, I love you. Light of your words will always guide me. Keep me from wrong, Daddy, I love you. How we did this week after week, getting up in front of people, preaching at you, all these eyeballs looking back. <laughs> I don't know, it scared me to death. <laughs> but he looked forward to it. It never scared him. He was fearless. He was a fearless man. I don't think I ever saw an ounce of fear in his face in my entire life. Not even over the last three months, not an ounce. Back when the, the accident first happened, we had lots of time in the hospital just to think, <coughs> trying to figure out the how and the why of it, all, of it all. But besides that, it also gave me a good chance to reflect on my dad, who he was, what he meant to me. And the only way I could figure it out was to just start writing it down. And I'll read a little bit of what I wrote about what my dad is to me. My dad is a real man. Amen. <laughs> a rare breed indeed. Rough and tough, a bit prickly on the outside. Definitely not touchy feely. Amen. <laughs> but deeply caring to a fault. Amen. Willing to die for you. Willing to kill for you. A man built to be respected. 
It's so able to be loved. It's a love. A man with conviction. Fearless against any attack on those convictions. The kind of man you better be prepared for if you're going to confront. A real man. A man of action. Willing to do what it, exactly what's necessary, no matter what the cost to himself. A man who'd knock my teeth out if it was needed. <laughs> and I'd still love him. That's him all right. I'd give it all to be just like him. <sighs> the Thursday that he passed, that night, when we finally got home, I just had some time to myself, sitting outside in the dark and the cold, just trying to figure it all out. Trying to figure out what, why, just how can I deal with this intense sadness? <laughs> I just started to wonder, where is he now? What's he do? I just, <laughs> I got this really clear image in my head. Him up in glory in his true body. <laughs> and if he just realizes where he is, and he's just up there shouting, Hallelujah! Amen. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Praise God! God, I'm home. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, Isaac, um, Isaac said he was very nervous uh, and scared, and that's a case of Stansel Brook. Your boss is not bang me. <laughs> <laughs> During this time, uh, this hard time that we've had, as a family and as a church over these long weeks, which seemed to drag while Ron was in hospital, something that, that um, was a blessing to me was how strong Mary Lee was during this time for Ron, for the family, and for the church. She was an encouragement to us over this period of time. And it didn't go unnoticed. And now it's going to be on least turn to say something. Thank you. People keep saying I'm, I was strong, I'm strong. I don't feel strong. <laughs> but inside me. one in my life go through hell and just wonder okay God why would such a good man have to go through this why would such a man with such greatness behind his name have to die like this. Why well, would he always said he wished he could just die behind the pulpit, have a heart attack and just die behind the pulpit or something. Something great, you know. But instead we had to watch him day after day become something that he wasn't weak and broken and paralyzed and hopeless and helpless. beyond my comprehension that a man of such esteem and such greatness and such strength and such boldness his, his whole Christian life could just be laying there like that for so long. I don't know what it was. I don't know. I, I can't explain it. I don't know why God let us see him like that in the end. But something God did do for us and to me, I will cherish for my whole entire life. Because when he died, a couple days before he died, he had a piece on his face 
that is unexplainable. I cannot explain it. There is such a peace that it, it, it only had to come from God. I've never seen him so peaceful. I've never seen anybody so peaceful like that in my life. And just before he died, he had been laying there for two days with no expression, nothing. And just before he died, that smile that broke. And then he died. And when he died, when his spirit left his body, God gave each one of us in that room, me and the kids, such an abundance of assurance that we will never have to live with doubt in our hearts that he went straight to heaven. Amen. And I just thank God so much for that because that's what I need. I need to picture him in heaven and doing all the things that you do in heaven. I need to, I, I, I don't have, I don't, I can't live without and I don't have any. That isn't how I wanted to start out. I wanted to start out by saying thank you to some people. I want to say thank you to my church for supporting me and the kids. I literally could not have done what I did, and that was going up to Pretoria every single day without your help. We wouldn't have been able to do it. And I just thank you for that support. We all knew that you were all praying, praying hard, fervently, regularly, and I thank you all for that. I thank you for my daughter for putting on Facebook what was going on so more people around the world could pray and be involved in this thing. We're not an open people. We don't expose ourselves to anybody ever. We've never done that. We're a very private family. And all of a sudden, we've just been exposed to the world. You know? But it seemed like it was all right at this point. Some special people. I don't know if Doug is here. But Doug was very special to me during this time. If you're here, Doug, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being so close and actually wonderful for me. Tracy, you're just wonderful. You're consistent in your care and showing it, and I want to thank you. I want to thank my neighbors up the street, the Mandys. Without their help, I couldn't have continued on with, without traveling. Shelly just came like a bright light in my life. And I want to thank Shelly. I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. I didn't write anything down. But I have a special, me and the kids, the ones that were here when this was all going on and, and, and when he died. And there was somebody that stuck by us, showed comfort, like we've never been shown before. There's somebody that wouldn't leave our side at the end. They sat up straight in a chair all night long, two nights in a row, never left. Came back with goodies from his wife, rented us a hotel, brought us toiletries to wash up with, and that's Clay. Clay, I just don't know how to thank you enough. You've been so wonderful to us. I just want to thank you for being there. And one last person. Gordon? I can't tell you how much I love you. This man has just showed to be such a comfort and a kind, gentle man in my life. I knew it was in you and stuff, but we've never really been real close and showed things, but now we're, I think we're very close. <laughs> and about my husband, the word great has been said a lot about him, and I think he was a great man in the end, but he wasn't always great. My husband was just an ordinary man who me to do, no matter what he meant it. He gave his whole entire being to serving God. He never flinched. He never wavered. He never stepped back. He never changed. 
He stuck with it to the day he died. I've never seen a man, and I know a lot of missionaries, I know a lot of pastors, I went to Bible school with a lot of guys, I know a lot of people. There's not one man, as far as I'm concerned, that can measure up to him. In faithfulness, devotedness, surrender to God. God made him the way he was. He let God make him the way he was. He allowed it to happen. And he stood in this, on the streets for 24 years almost, preaching for one reason. God called him. He stood behind that pulpit in that church because God called him. He did all that he did because God called him. He answered the call. He wanted nothing else but to have men to be raised up in his church, to get saved, and come out of that church serving him, doing something for him. He wanted to raise courageous guys, courageous women, that would do what they knew God had called them to do. I taught Sunday school to a bunch of kids. <coughs> Nothing really came out of it. My husband preached to a bunch of men in church and women. We have Yvonne and Maggie. Other than that, we have some good, faithful people that I thank God for. I think God ingrained the Word of God in you and, and worked in you so you, we would have some good, faithful people that we could rely on in, in, in these pillars of our church. But where's the fruit? Where's the guy that God called to do something? And you didn't do it. You're not doing it. Like my husband would say, shame on you. And I want nothing more than... I, I, I keep thinking of Samson. Samson did more for God in his death than he did in his life. And something good could come out of that even better in his death for God than my husband did in his life. To me, that would be a great tribute to him. If somehow this could wake up people and to live right for God, just start there. Get your life together. Just become faithful. Just read the Bible. Just start praying. Just start witnessing a bit. It's not about us. This isn't about us. This is about God. He created us for His pleasure. He created us <coughs> for His glory, for Himself. It's not about us. It's for God. We're to be living for Him, serving Him, pleasing Him. And through all of this, in my heart, I just wanted God to get glory out of it. I thought, it's not about me. This is all going to pass. But eternity is for eternity. And what comes out of it, I want to last for eternity. And is anybody in this room that isn't saved? You don't know what we're talking about? You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? I'm standing in my husband's place. Because if he was here, he'd be doing the same thing. Amen. Trying to get you saved. Amen. Because there's a heaven, and it's as real as we're sitting here. And there's a hell, and it's as real as we're sitting here. And you make a choice to which place you go to. And the choice comes by either accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior or rejecting Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's simple as that. You accept the God that created you, that died for you, you'll go to heaven. You reject the God that created you and died for you, you'll go to eternal punishment, which is hell. For the Christians who are loafers and have done nothing with their lives, I would admonish you to get off your butt and quit it and do something for him once and for all.
make the choice and do something with what you know God put in you to do in the first place. And quit buffing it, quit fighting it, give into it. Be courageous. Play the man or the woman. And for me, my little thing between me and my husband, my little sentimental thing, the night we came home from the hospital after he died, I, I immediately opened my Bible and I wrote this down. This is July 10th, 2013. And around 9 p.m., the best friend I've ever had and my husband left me for heaven. I loved him dearly. To me and the kids, he was the greatest man on earth. I no longer have my dear husband to keep me company. We lived a full life together, fulfilled so many dreams. We've done so many things together, from mountain climbing, having kids, and working together on the mission field in Africa. I envy you, my dear husband. I really wish I could be where you're at right now. I've longed for heaven for so many years and you get to be there. You have made heaven even more sweeter for me, for now I'm longing for not only to see Christ, but also you, till we meet again. Amen. Thank you, Marilyn and the family. We knew all along that that wasn't going to be easy. We're going to sing another hymn together. Please get your hymn book. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right, we're going to stand together and we're going to sing. Now, after <coughs> we have sung this hymn, we're going to sit down again and I'm going to give an opportunity to anybody else who would like to share a testimony uh, relevant to Ron's life or a tribute to him to come and give a, a short tribute as well. Let's sing this hymn together. Look, he saints, the sight is glorious. <coughs>
came to the country and started the church here. Francie was one of the first people that was saved under his ministry, so Francie was very special to Ron and to us in the church. One thing that we wanted to do now was um, our missionaries that were sent out from our church, Yvonne and Mochi, they um, would have loved to have been with us today. But uh, they had gone to Indonesia, to Papua, the other side of the world, and they weren't able to get back to for the service this morning. But they've sent a letter to the church, and we're, uh, and uh, um, to Ron, and we're going to ask Philip to come and read that letter to us. <coughs> this is the letter received from Ivan. It starts off by saying, "Dear uh, Can you hear down at the back of us? It starts, off, it starts off by saying, Dear Pastor Ron, I am without words and only my tears and, and brokenness can really convey my feelings at this moment. Never did I know that the 4th of March 2012, the day we left for Indonesia, would be the last time that I would ever see you again here on earth. Never did I know I would not be able to say goodbye or attend your funeral. I was so looking forward that you would come and visit us in Papua. I don't know what to say except to cry. I want to thank you, although you, were, you are with Jesus now, for your life that you have invested in, in mine. I thank the Lord that you could be my pastor and spiritual father for over 20 years. You were such a wonderful Christian example to me. You were bold in your proclamation of the gospel, steadfast in your belief about God's word, always faithful and zealous to win souls for Christ, a fiery preacher, a man of prayer. You lived a holy life and had a close and intimate relationship with God. Your sermons always spoke to my heart and your dedication to, the, to be faithful missionary for Christ's sake to South Africa was and is incomparable. You were truly a man of God and my life was deeply influenced by you. It feels as if my leader is gone, but I realized that I should keep my eyes firm on Christ my rock and be faithful as you would have been. My mom just recently encouraged me with these words. Even Remember, although you cannot attend Pastor Ron's funeral, know that you are at the place where he would have wanted you to be. Pastor, your life really did leave a legacy behind. And I will thank God always for your life. May your funeral be to the glory of God. And may precious souls be saved for Christ's name, as you would have desired it to be. I immensely, immensely miss you, and my life would never be the same without you. Thank you, Philip. Somebody else? Okay, while well, 
everybody thinking. Let's turn to the next hymn that comes out fount of every blessing. <laughs>
And that what, what Mary Lee says now, I, I know this, that, that Ron has lived his life. I asked him the one time we, we, um, we were street preaching in Alberton, and I said to him, are you satisfied? And he says, I am. And I said, why? He says, because I'm doing what God called me to do. And he was satisfied. He was doing what it is that the Lord had, had instructed him to do. He was faithful. You know, if, if Ron is one of the people in my life, and I have about five. Uh, he's one of the people in my life that have made a massive difference. A massive difference. And Mary Lee says just now that, you know, Ron allowed God to make him who he is and who he was. And I agree. I, I thank God that Ron came to South Africa. I thank God for his faithfulness in preaching the gospel. Um, I thank God for the truth that, that Ron gave me, that she, he shared with me. I was going to say this before I finish, that, that there was a... You, you guys heard the story about Ron and you know, the, the things that he's been through in life, but we used to go street preaching, me and Kevin and Neil and um, Yaku and the guys, and he used to have this thing where he used to say, you and me, bro, till the wheels fall off. And, it, you know, to me, it, it's like... <coughs> I, I drove in here this morning and I said, I don't want to be here. It, it, it is surreal to me to think that Ron has left. It really is. It, it is. He has left a massive, massive vacuum, a gap, that where, where he was. Um, he, he's the kind of person I will never forget in my entire life. He's really made a huge impact. And merely, you know, we, we, you speak about the fruits. Um, I think if I look at the church and I look at the kind of people that are in the church, that there are some soldiers in the cross here, some, some strong people for God. And I want to tell you this also, as you speak about what God called you to do. When I went to go and see Ron in the hospital that night and, and we prayed together, it was amazing. Eh? He, he, wasn't, he wasn't like strong, but when we were praying, when he said Amen, it sounded like the Ron that I knew. There was a, there's this... But, but I was, I must be honest, I was under huge conviction when I got home. I still said to my wife, I'm, I'm reminded very, very bluntly about what it is that God has called me to do, which in the last few years I have failed to do. So I, I, I challenge every one of you today that for whatever it is that Ron's done in your life, you know, and, and the basic things about Bible reading, you know, Ron implanted a thing in me years ago where it was like, he challenged the church. I don't know if you guys remember the, the watch night services we used to get up and he'd say, who, who read their Bible for the last week? I remember the one night it was Jenny. She'd read it for the last who knows how long. And I was under such conviction that that night I said, by the grace of God, I will read my Bible every single day of my life until the Lord comes home. And that hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. But he, he was a great man. He is a great man. Um, we're going to miss him. For me, he was like, you know, he... he him and uh, Brother Kevin filled in a lot of what, what my dad's role was. And he was an example to me. And if Ron had been the sissy Christian, which um, people put out in the world today, the image the Christians put out, uh, I, I doubt that I would have got saved. I doubt that if I had got saved, I would have gotten, I would have grown in the Lord. But he set an example for me as a real man. And Brother Ron, I'm going to miss you. I really am. I do already. And I'm going to miss you. And uh, I just want to say this one, one thing on a lighter note. I remember when Ron was still eating meat. <laughs> he, would, he would talk about these giant Big Macs in heaven. <laughs> Maybe watching these huge things come flying out of the sky. Um, <laughs> that, that was Ron, you know. We'd, we'd go on tangents, but he was, he was an encouragement to me and a blessing to me. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful. I thank God for him, and I thank, I thank Ron for his faithfulness and what he's done for me in my life. God bless you guys. Thanks. Brian has known the Lord since, uh, so has known Ron since he's a little boy. He's a bit bigger now. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I didn't really want to come up here, but I felt that the Lord has really asked me to just share this small little moment that I've been passed around for in my life. We were growing up in the year, I was still probably eight or nine years old, and I remember the very first service was at Meredith and Ron's house, and um, we, we used to sing the old type of hymns, and 
we used to um, listen to false alarm preach. Now, as a small boy, you must imagine the power in false alarm's voice. For a small boy, I was like over half, like covered as a man. So this is what a man of God looks like. You know, this is uh, being my film from a small boy's impression. And um, I remember the one day he asked us if we would like to go into Manhattan and, and join him 